Welcome everyone. Thanks for attending GreenSpring's 2020 Year in Review webinar. My name is Pat Collins and I chair our investment committee. As many of you know, GreenSpring's investment strategy is led by this committee and I'm pleased to have two of our investment committee members join us on the call today. Molly Getz is a partner at the firm and practice lead for our private client group. And Greg Hobson is also a partner and practice lead for our institutional group. We have a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. Let's first start by looking at 2020 and the roller coaster of a ride it was for stock investors. Molly, can you walk us through what happened last year? Sure, Pat. We were going along pretty well at the beginning of the year, and then the virus hit. So as you can see, we had a huge decline in February and March as we grappled with uncertainty surrounding the virus. But as more information became available, the market began to digest and process this information, and we began to see the market recover. That's great. And, and I think one of the main questions that we were hearing last year, and maybe even still to this day, is how is it that the market has recovered so rapidly, given all of the news um, from the economy, as well as some of the, the virus news, has continued to be pretty bad? That's a great question and one that we got a lot. So the economy is a snapshot of what conditions are today and what the most recent numbers tell us about what we have just experienced. But markets are forward looking as they aggregate and price in what business conditions will be in the future. So the markets are looking at what might impact a company's cash flows and in turn the stock's value. Bottom line, stock market is not the economy and you can't use the words markets and economy interchangeably. Great, thank you. And, and Greg, were there any lessons you think we can take away from last year? Yeah, Pat. Uh, number one, I'd say that knowing the future is usually not enough. Timing the market is a near impossible task, even if you predict what is happening correctly. I mean, who would have guessed the S&P would have been up 18% last year with all of the events we experienced? Secondly, diversification still works. Bonds held up extremely well during the downturn, and you really needed to have exposure to various asset classes to help weather that downturn last year. Well, we know the market is volatile, and this chart really shows the volatility you can expect if you are a stock investor. So Greg, can you talk to us about some of the important aspects of this chart and what you think are the biggest takeaways? Yeah, and uh, this is actually one of my favorite charts. I've shown this chart uh, for years through employee education meetings that we've conducted for clients. And really what you see here is that the performance of stocks can be wildly different from day to day and year to year. And investors uh, would do well to consider volatility to be 100% normal. This graph really displays the returns of the S&P 500 index going back 30 years to 1990. The blue bars show the return for the entire calendar year. So for example, in 2020, up 18% with the blue bar. The black and red whiskers show the largest gain and decline within each year. So even in years with high calendar year returns, like last year, a large intra-year decline may have occurred, like we saw in February and March. The performance for any time period does not need to prompt action necessarily. Focusing on the long term can help you block out the noise of the day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month type of events. So Molly, 2020, uh from my view, looks like it had one of the largest differences between intra-year gains and intra-year losses. How did GreenSpring's private client team handle such variability in returns last year? Yeah, in a couple of ways, Pat. So of course, many Zoom calls, many phone calls as we coach clients to stick with their overall plan. We also continue to stress test client portfolios plan against their investments to make sure they were still on track. Since we do plan for varying degrees of volatility in our clients' plans. And we really have to applaud our clients. They were net buyers of stocks last year, meaning on average, our clients were buying stocks versus selling them, which as, as we know, rewarded them very well. Another strategy we used was rebalancing. So rebalancing is our strategy for taking advantage of the market moves by taking a disciplined approach to selling high and buying low. So when the market moves, certain asset classes may dip below our target allocation. For example, in February and March, with the stock market drop, our stock allocation drifted below our target. 
So when this happens, we wanna bring that asset class back to target so that we add to the asset class that is underweight and trim an asset class that is overweight. And so it doesn't feel very good at the time, but it's a disciplined way to sell high and buy low. One other strategy we employed was tax loss harvesting. So when a fund goes down, if it's declined in value, we can sell that fund and simultaneously buy a similar fund so we don't lose any market exposure. But in the process, we capture the loss from the fund that has gone down. And then we can use this loss to offset gains for this year, potentially future years, and even to some extent, some income for the current year. Great, that makes sense. So 2020 was really an amazing year when it came to the markets and the diversion we saw across different asset classes. So Molly, can you walk us through some of that uh, in this chart that we're gonna be looking at and why you think it's so important? Sure. So first we look at the S&P, the 500 biggest stocks in the U.S. stock market. That generated a return of 16.8%. And then we can look at the five largest holdings in the S&P, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, and see that they really had a phenomenal year, nearly tripling the return of the S&P. And when you exclude only 1% of the stocks of the S&P, the other 495 stocks only had a 12.7% return. One other important item to note is how expensive they are compared to their peers in the S&P. The PE ratio, price to earnings ratio, is a measure that looks at how expensive stocks are compared to their earnings. And on average, the majority of stocks are about half as expensive as those five largest stocks that I mentioned. That's great. So Greg, it really appears that these five largest stocks really drove quite a bit of the returns last year. What should clients understand moving forward after such a big year uh, in, the, in the market and in, in these stocks? Well, first, I think that the conditions that we saw with the coronavirus were hopefully a once in a lifetime event. So I'm not sure we'll see that type of environment uh, in, and, and that led to such a divergence in returns in future years. Second, these stocks are getting expensive and that is certainly a reason for some concern. Finally, these stocks were expensive last year as well. So that is not a reason to completely abandon a stock or a sector, but we think it definitely warrants caution and if those positions haven't been trimmed, it probably makes sense to consider that they've consider that given the run they've had so far. Great. And, and I guess piggybacking on that last point, this chart that we're looking at here breaks down different asset class returns over the last three years versus their long term averages. And it really does seem like a divergence has emerged. So Greg, what, what are the main takeaways from this chart our clients really should be aware of? Really two things. First, growth stocks have been on an absolute tear and have 10% per year higher returns than their long-term averages. It's really hard to keep up that pace. And you can see that in the variance in U.S. large growth and U.S. small growth, more than 10%. Second, other asset classes have significantly lagged their historical returns. We don't know when conditions will turn, but it's important to note that, so, that nothing lasts forever and price and valuation does matter in the long term. So Molly, the investment committee, uh, or is the investment committee making any changes to portfolios in light of these divergences that we're looking at here? So Pat, really the movement in the market has forced us to make changes in the portfolio just to stay in line with our target allocations. That means that growth in U.S. stocks have been the ones being trimmed and the asset classes that have lagged are the ones to which we are adding. So, you know, as Greg mentioned, we don't know or try to predict when the trend will change, but there is some evidence that may have already started. For example, within the U.S. over the last six months, U.S. small cap value stocks, which have been the worst performer in the U.S., has beaten US large cap growth, the best performer of the last three years by nearly 30%. These movements happen quickly 
which is why we maintain exposure to these areas of the market versus trying to predict them ahead of time. One of the trends or the long-term trends we've seen is falling interest rates. Really since the 1980s, there's been downward pressure on interest rates. So Molly, maybe you could first start uh, to tell us why that could be concerning. First, you'll typically see an inverse relationship between interest rates and bond prices in the near term. So when rates go up, bond prices go down. And what we've seen over the last 40 years is that rates have gone down, which has pushed up bond prices. At some point, many are concerned we can't get much lower since interest rates are approaching 0%. Now this is great for borrowers, but not so great for savers when you can only generate very low returns on safe investments like CDs, money markets, and bonds. My final comment is that if we have hit bottom in rates, many are concerned we could see bond returns really be lousy if we see an increase in rates. Right, so, so Greg, how is Greenspring thinking about this possibility of rising rates and, and how have we positioned portfolios? Well, first, you'll see from the chart that rising rates doesn't necessarily mean that bond returns will be negative. The last period we saw the Fed raise rates was from 2015 to 2019. And even though we saw a pretty significant increase in the Fed funds rate from 0.12% to 2.42%, which is basically short-term interest rates that impact things like money markets and savings accounts that Molly had mentioned for savers, bond returns were still positive over that time period with a 3.32% average annual return. So we don't think that rising rates necessarily means cat catastrophe for bond investors. This is because as rates rise, bonds in the portfolio can be reinvested at higher rates. While you'll see some periods of negative returns on this chart, the general move higher in short-term rates was not devastating. Two other items that we have implemented in our portfolio that may help with rising rates or inflation in our bond assets in, in TIPS and international bonds. TIPS or Treasury Inflation Protected Securities have a feature in which the bond principle is adjusted upwards at the rate of inflation. And international bonds follow a different yield curve. For example, Germany and Canada's bonds generate different yields than US bonds. So it's very possible you can have rates going up in one country and down in another. So this diversification should be helpful under those circumstances. Great, so, so our time was really spent looking at 2020 and most of our clients know we are in a firm that makes big predictions about the future. So let's talk about some of the things we'll be at least keeping an eye out for in 2021. Greg, we talked about this already. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about this value and growth theme uh, that was mentioned earlier in the presentation? Well, last year around the depths of the market, values performance compared to growth was in a position that we had never seen before. And as Molly mentioned earlier, that trend has started to change, but we'll continue to keep an eye on this development both in the US as well as overseas. And you know, we never take an all or nothing approach. So we have exposure to both asset classes. But we want to make sure we understand if that trend is sustainable. Great. And, and Molly, we just talked about rising interest rates. And Greg mentioned how portfolios are positioned at Greenspring. Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll just add that we will, of course, be monitoring rates and inflation. One final thing I would note about our portfolios is they tend to be very high quality. So they really add value when the stock market is falling. We definitely saw this in March of 2020. Similarly, we don't own any long-term bonds in the portfolio, which means if rates do go up, many of our bonds that mature in the short term will be able to be reinvested at higher rates. Great, thank you. Greg, how is Greenspring thinking about the balance between US and international stocks and portfolios? First, there's ample evidence that having a mix of US and international stocks and bonds in a portfolio adds value 
through lower volatility without really sacrificing returns. So we believe maintaining a balance between the two is 100% appropriate. Second, for as great as the US did in 2020 from a returns perspective, it didn't even rank in the top five countries for stock market returns. Again, another reason for maintaining exposure to international companies that may actually outperform the US market. And finally, the US market has generated about three times the return of the overall international market in the last three years. While we aren't making a prediction, we think now is not the time to abandon international investing, given the historical flip-flopping of the performance of the US markets and the international stock markets. Great. And then finally, Molly, we have a new administration. And I know Greenspring doesn't put much weight in pol politicians having significant impact on the investment markets, but there are, any, are there any items that we're thinking about with the new president and Congress? You're right, Pat. We don't tend to make portfolio changes due to who is in political office. There just really isn't any evidence we have seen that who is in office impacts returns or can be exploited by an investor in some way. But with that being said, the new president does have some interesting tax policies he has laid out that we are definitely keeping an eye on. That could probably be a whole or other presentation, but we are looking at changes in capital gains rates, income tax rates, retirement contribution deductibility, and estate planning tax, and how that may impact clients. If any of those proposals really look likely to pass, we will start to dig into how to strategize on a client-by-client -client basis. Well, thank you both for taking the time to share your thoughts about 2020 and the upcoming year. I want to thank everyone else for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We wish you a happy and prosperous new year.